Scripture this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Romans 12, 1 through 5. I invite you to hear these words this morning. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, you ought not, not, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function. So we who are many are one in one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Now, for the last couple weeks now, you know, I started a new series you know, on getting back to the basics. You know, it's just something that we need to do sometimes. We need to get back to the basics, no matter how far along we might be in you know, whatever journey or whatever it might be. Sometimes we need to get back to where we started and make sure we shore up the foundations. You know, as I started out a couple weeks ago, you know, talking about, you know, even, you know, I, I talked about a couple, you know, coaches and, you know, and, you know, when they did this with their sports teams, even professional athletes, you know, they were allowed to, they, you know, they were able to go out and dominate, you know, and whatever, you know, whatever sport they're in, you know, even getting back to, you know, simple things like asking, you know, professional basketball players, what's the point of the game? And when they try to come up with all kinds of things, and, and, but the whole point of the game is to get the basketball in the hole. I mean, that's it. That's simple. You know, we try to, sometimes we try to make things more complicated than they have to be. But sometimes we, so sometimes we need to get back to the basics. And you know, for that as Christians, one of the basics that we need to know is discerning the will of God. You know, that for, for ourselves and for our churches, what is the will of God? You know, and so we started a couple weeks ago, and, you know, very first and foremost, if we want to know what the will of God is, we got to know this right here. We got to know this word. You know, there's a lot of people that I think you know, that want to know or they want to have a, like an audible voice from God, you know, tell, this, tell, this super clear saying, this is exactly where I, what I want you to do, you know, where I want you to go. Kind of like Moses when he heard the voice from the burning bush. You know, God said, you know, God told him, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring my people out. You know, God told him very clearly what he was supposed to do. A lot of us, we want that kind of experience. But for us, if we want to hear the voice of God, first and foremost, we have to go here, because this is the word of God given to us. So we have to start here. You know, that's our basis for everything. You know, and then like, uh, you know, like I said last week, I, I, I used the term apparently a lot of people haven't heard of. You know, in our Methodist tradition, we talk about the, uh, something called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Which is, you know, we basically saying we, we don't read Scripture in a vacuum. You know, there are some other things that help us to understand Scripture. You know, for, and for us, and, you know, from going back to John Wesley, you know, we talk about, you know, Scripture above, you know, everything, but then also tradition, reason, and experience that can help us to understand the will of God, help us understand Scripture. Now, as I said last week, you know, the idea of a quadrilateral might, is actually a little bit misleading because sometimes we, it makes us think of like a square or a rectangle and like things are equal, but they're not. Because Scripture is primary. 
but the others can help us to understand Scripture. You know, like I was talking about last week with tradition. You know, tradition, going back to those who have gone before, listening to the voices of Christians who have gone before, especially, you know, the, the you know, first few hundred years of Christianity, you know, those who really were within a few generations of Jesus and who struggled to understand what, you know, Christianity really was all about, the core of Christianity. You know, those were where we come up with the creeds, like the, the you know, the Apostles' Creed, where it says this is the core of who we are, what we believe. But then other, other, you know, other voices throughout the centuries of Christians who have, been, have struggled with the Christian life and, and how to live the way Christ, God would have us to. You know, voices like John Wesley. You know, in our Methodist tradition, we go back, you know, John Wesley, who was, you know, really tried to bring about revival in the church. And even his, and his brother Charles Wesley, we see a lot of his stuff from our hymns in the hymnal. You know, and, I, and sometimes for me, that speaks to me about as much as anything. Because it's the music. You know, but in other voices, you know, for, you know, me when I'm studying, you know, scriptures, going back to the commentaries, learning from others, learning from those voices that came before. You know, as I've said, you know, I, I really do believe it's the... the the peak, the height of arrogance to think that we know better than all those Christians who've come before. I really do believe that. Yeah, like I said last week, C.S. Lewis called it chronological snobbery, which a little different way of saying it, but chronological snobbery, thinking that we know better. But what it comes down to is our human, human pride, thinking that we know better, thinking that we're smarter. Thinking we're smarter in Scripture, thinking we're smarter than goes to come before. But we need to go back. We need to listen. And this morning, you know, one of the, the other things that we talk about to help, that helps us to understand truly the will of God is reason. Reason. Our intellect. Our brains. Yeah, have you ever heard, you know, heard this stereotype that there may be people... Think that if you're going to come into a church, you've got to, you know, uh, check your brain at the door. You ever heard that? There are people who think that. There are people who think that when Christians come into church, we've got to check our brains at the door. And I think part of that is because, you know, we, kinda, we have this idea that faith and reason are somehow contradictory. They, you know, they don't go together. You know, that we have to accept all this completely on faith, that there's no, that we can't really reason it out. It's just, it's just completely, you know, completely faithful. Um, and so we can't reason it out. But even Paul said, you know, be, always be ready to give an account for the faith that you have. You know, God did not give us our brains to not use them. I, I don't believe that. You know, I believe that God gave us our brains for a reason. You know, and that's one of the things that separates us from, you know, the rest of the animal kingdom. Because we are able to reason now, you know, the, you know, and what's going on around us. We're able to reason out, you know, the consequences of our actions. We're able to reason out things that other animals cannot. So God gave us our brains for a reason and expects us to use them. But we have to be careful because even then, it's our brains that can get us into a lot of trouble too. You know, our, like I said, we have you know this thing called pride, and so and we like to sometimes think that we're smarter than everybody else, right? You know, we think it, you know, and, and, you know that because we maybe we get a little bit of learning sometimes, and, and maybe we see people who have gone off to school. You know, and maybe they come back and now they, you know, they act like a different person or, you know, kind of high and mighty, whatever, too big for their britches, right? You know, even when I was talking about going to seminary, one of the things that I, you know, jokes that I heard was, I'll be careful there in cemetery. You ever heard that? Yeah, because they think that going, going to seminary is somehow going to kill your faith. It make, make you all intellectual and going to kill your faith. Now, I heard that. Be careful in cemetery. But 
you know, we, do, we, we see this. I, I even remember uh, Jerry Clower. Now, uh, y'all know Jerry Clower, right? Now, I grew up list, you know, listening to you know, his, his comedy. I think he, he's, one, I mean, he's one of the greats. But uh, I remember him telling a story, and it's been a while, so I don't remember all the details. But he was talking about going to church, and, and uh, it was one of the, you know, it was a, somebody, a guy who had grown up in that church, just as country as the rest of them, but yet went off to got some learning and came back and got up there and was pr- trying to preach and was using all these big fancy words and stuff and nobody able to understand him. And, and I think it was Marcel Letbetter that was sitting next to Jerry said, oh, Jerry, he ain't right. He's not right. He, he's just like the rest of us, he, but he, now he thinks he's better than the rest of us getting up there. Because he done went off and got him some learning. So he thinks he's better. And he wasn't having none of it. <laughs> but, so we, you know, we have this, you know, we do have this human tendency towards pride, thinking that we know better. So we have to be careful. So how can our reason help us? You know, it, we have to be careful. Our reason has to be grounded First and foremost, here. And our reason and our faith have to work together. You know, here in the book of Romans, you know, Romans is, is you know, it's here at the beginning, you know, the, of the other letters, you know, not because it came before the other letters, but it's kind of because it's kind of a more complete thought from Paul. Because he is writing to people that he does not know. In fact, most of the way through years, there's no reference to, you know, the actual people there most of the, in most of the letter, you know, any of the actual situations that they're dealing with. You know, he is writing to people that he does not know. And so this is a more, com- very, you know, more complete thought from the book of Paul. In the very first part, I mean, he does kind of like he does in some of his other letters. You know, he kind of starts off with some of the basics you know, like helping us to understand, you know, like the, uh, you know, in Romans, he helps us to understand the grace, the mercy of love of God. And then he goes from understanding to try to make it practical. How do we actually make this, you know, make a difference in our lives? Because even no matter what you think, you I mean, what, you know, what, what kind of understanding you have or anything, if it does not make a difference in your life, it's worthless. It's got to be practical. And so here he is actually, he's kind of been talking about, you know, helping us understand the love, the mercy, the grace of God. And then here in chapter 12, he kind of makes this transition towards the practical. So what does this mean for us? And that's where he comes here. You know, and he's got this, there's this therefore in there. And that's the, you know, it, it says because of all this, because of the grace, because of the love, the mercy of God. Because of this, he said, I appeal to you, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies. For him, the, the word that he used here, you know, this is everything. Everything that you are. Your physical body, your, your intellect, your heart, everything. Give everything over to God. You know, this is your spiritual worship. With, with, you know, and actually, the, spirit, the word behind spiritual really is kind of is the same word we use for logic. It's logical. It's reasonable. You know, so it's... You know, it's, it includes... This right here, you know, but it's a it's living worship, you know, and as opposed, you know, the, for the Jews when they brought their sacrifices, you know, they put their sacrifice on the altar, they burned them up, and it was dead and gone. But for us, living worship, living sacrifice means that we offer ourselves everything that we are to God, that we are going to live for Him. We're going to live for God. We're going to give Him all that we are. That's, I mean, that's our body, that's our heart, that's our mind. And he says, do not be conformed 
to this world. And I know these are words that we're, we've heard. Do not be conformed to this world or to this age. Don't be conformed to the, the, you know, the ways of this world. Now I know that there are ways that we are formed kind of based on the world, the time that we are born in. I mean, that's easy to see, you know, for, you know, those are, you know, when they're uh, older now and, you know, when they were born, there were no computers or anything, and they now may struggle with them. You know, people in my generation that, you know, we started seeing computers when we were younger, and so now we, ha we have a better understanding. You know, and then and the kids now, they never know in a world where there hasn't been computers and tablets and phones and everything. So there are some ways that we are kind of, you know, formed by the world that we're, li we're living in. But, but we should not, our, our thoughts, our hearts should not be conformed to this world. It's not, you know, we don't go along with everything this world says. You know, because this world will lead us astray every time. And he says, the, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And again, I don't know, sometimes we lose a lot in English. I've, been, I've noticed that. So I don't know, so I've been trying to... You know, for years, like, I, I don't know, I, I studied a little bit of Greek in seminary, and then I, like, I didn't use a lot of it, but I've been trying to go back, because sometimes we lose a lot in translation. You know, but the word behind transform really is like metamorphosis. You know, it's the same idea, you know, the caterpillar going into the cocoon so that it can come out later on as a butterfly. And it goes into the cocoon, and what happens to the caterpillar? It kind of gets broken down into the little parts, right? Into the, this goo inside the cocoon. And that has to happen so that when it comes out, it can come out beautiful and ready to fly, right? You know, it has to, you know, completely change. And that's what Paul is saying here, you know, that for us, you know, to, for our, to transform our minds. Let them be completely changed by the renewing, renewing of our minds so that we can discern what is the will of God. The, the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So where our reasons can help us to understand the will of God. But when, they are, when our will, or when our reason is transformed by Scripture, when our, when our reason is transformed by offering ourselves completely to God. That's, what, that's when our reason can help us. You know, and he goes on, and we, we, you know, we've heard this other part. You know, you know, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. I mean, he goes on, he says, be humble. You know, we need to remember that we are all in this together. That none among us is greater than anybody else. You know, we, we can't start thinking that we're too, you know, get, you know, we're somehow smarter than everybody else or anything, but, you know, get too big for our britches. So we need to be humble. And part of that comes from really giving ourselves completely, including our reason, everything over to God. And letting our, letting our reason, letting everything be transformed. You know, and again, it goes back, you know, to this. I mean, the way our minds are transformed is by really just soaking in everything God has given. Soaking in His Word. And, and, and even... You know, looking around us, I mean, our reason can help us to make sense of the things that are going on around us. I mean, right now, with the changing of the seasons, I mean, we see, you know, this, the, the beautiful design of creation, right? You know, in the changing of the leaves and, you know, the birds flying south, all these things that, have, that work together as the temperatures drop and everything, and it's our reason helps us understand when we're, you know, when we're 
focused on God, and we got it where you know, we're giving ourselves over to him, that helps us understand, oh, this is because God designed it this way. He created it this way. And our reason can help us understand. And our reason and our faith can work together. You know, it's our reason that helps us to understand the promises of God. You know, and even where and even where places where scripture might not specifically say, you know, you know, if we want to ask God, okay, what do I need to do this day? How can I help somebody? That's a very specific thing. And it may, I mean there might not be something in here that says today you need to help this person down the road here. But if our brains, if our reason, if we are being transformed by this word here, then when we see somebody who is in need, then our brains would say, hey, this is where you put what you read in Scripture. So our, our reason can help us. Show us what we need to do. And it's our reason that helps us understand the promises of God. Like I've got, I mean, even, you know, probably like most of us, i got these bookmarks and that, and some of them have promises, you know, from Scripture and stuff on them. You know, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You know, it's our uh, mind that helps me to understand that means that I need to trust in God. Give Him all that I have. You know, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. These are promises from Scripture. And my brain helps me to understand them. You know, and even, you know, we are saved by faith, right? We are saved by faith alone. But how do we know that we're saved? Well, by understanding, you know, in Scripture it says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I know that when I call upon Him, when I trust in Him, I believe in Him, that I'm saved. Our brains work together with our faith. That if we give him everything that we have. But we have to be careful not to think that we're somehow better than anybody else. But our brains do help us. You know, because we don't come to this in a vacuum. We don't come to Scripture you know, a completely void of anything, you know. We have to have the other things that help us to understand it. But the more we read this, the more we take in all of God that he has given, the more we can understand it. And the, and the more our reason is controlled by Scripture, by the will of God. So, your know, reason... Reason is important. You know, like I said, we don't check our brains at the door. And you know, there's, and there's a lot of proof for Scripture outside of Scripture. And there are many who have come to faith because God worked in them and allowed them to see the proof for Scripture outside of Scripture. You know, there, God will use whatever means He needs to for us. You know, some people are, are just naturally more intellectual. Some people are more feeling, more emotional. But, he, you know, we, we need to have those working together. You know, our reason doesn't just take us so far and then faith take us the rest of the way, which is what a lot of people think. They really do work together. We are saved by faith, but our reason helps us to understand what the will of God is. Like I said... You know, we might not necessarily see, okay, you know, it's saying, you know, when we ask God, what am I supposed to do today? How can I help somebody today? You know, or, you know, or if we ask God, you know, we're in a certain situation, you know, which way do I need to go? Scripture might not necessarily have that specific situation. But the more we know of Scripture, the more we've been transformed by Scripture, 
the more we can say, okay, this is the way God wants me to go. Right? Have you been there? Our reason helps us to understand. But we need to keep it, keep humble. We need to remember just because maybe we got the way we, we, you know, we get some, you know, get some learning that helps us a little bit. You know, we are still, we are still all in this together. We can't, you know, we can't get too big for our britches. We have to remain humble. And part of that is remembering Scripture says that we are but dust and the dust we shall return. Right? Again, our reason helping us understand Scripture that it keeps us humble if we read it all. Right? We take it in. And there are passages of this word that are hard to understand. That's okay. The more we go dive into it, the more God will help us to understand. But he expects us to use this right here. Right? Amen.